Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our congregation, Lador Vador's Controversial Ish Issues Forum, Rabbi Sam Silver Controversial Issues Forum, this August 18, 2021, 7 p.m. We have our Rabbi Barry Silver and our guest, Dan Barker. And take it away, gentlemen. Rabbi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is really an exciting day for me because Dan Barker is one of my heroes. I've heard him on the internet and I thought, got to get this guy over at Lador Vador. He's really good. And the reason why he's good is he takes no prisoners. He's a, a former Christian fundamentalist clergy. And now he knows where all the bodies are buried. And he does a great job in debating and he calls it like he sees it. And so I really admire that and I respect what he does and especially his organization, Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I encourage people to check it out and uh, you might wanna consider joining the organization. I'll tell you that I do support it even though I'm a, a rabbi and I support what Dan does. I also asked him to not spare me at all. So this is gonna be a vigorous debate and uh, I'm willing to accept his uh, slings and arrows against all religion. The debate that we're doing today is going to be, does religion serve a useful purpose or still serve a useful purpose in the modern world? So I'll get an intro, uh, Dan Bark will get an intro, then we'll go back and forth a little bit, and then we'll open it up to uh, everybody here. Uh, in order to answer this question, does religion serve a useful purpose? We have to define what religion is. I find that a lot of times the atheists define religion in a rather narrow way. So I would tend to agree with what they're saying. There are the so-called four horsemen of atheism and uh, Dawkins and Danette and uh, Hitchens and Harris. And I'm great fans and admirers of all of them. In fact, my t-shirt says, in science we trust. I, um, I think what they're doing is a great thing because we need to hold all religion accountable, including mine. But in response to the four horsemen of atheism, I like to think of myself as a horse of a different color, a, uh, a silver horse perhaps. And instead of saying nay to religion, I say yay to religion because I define religion perhaps in a way that goes beyond what they do. They tend to define religion as belief in a supernatural, and they believe and they define God as a supernatural being. So let me state from the outset: if religion were to define be defined so narrowly that it is belief in a supernatural being, then I would say it serves no useful purpose, or the useful purpose that it could serve is far outweighed by the detrimental purpose. So when it comes to supernatural beings, I think it's, I agree with uh, Dan and the atheists 100%. I think it's irrational. I think it's dangerous and I don't support it. Um, if you're going to describe God as a supernatural being, not only don't I support it, I don't believe in it and I think it's harmful. So I think we need to understand that from the outset. So people would ask, well, how could you be a rabbi, why would you be religious? You don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in the supernatural. I believe the natural is super. Let me explain my understanding of religion and then we have something useful to talk about. My father explained it to me. He was a rabbi and a founder of Congregation Lador Vador. He told me that the word religion comes from the same root as the word ligament. The L-I-G in religion means to bind or tie together as a ligament binds parts of the body together. In Spanish, they say ligar, to tie together, and a league brings people together. I define religion as joining together everything in the cosmos. Uh, I believe the past, the present, the future, who we are, who we could be, all people, all living things, all elements. It's uniting everything and transcending yourself to think about something greater than yourself. That to me is religion. Is there some overarching supernatural being 
who started it on top of it, organizing it, directing it? Absolutely not. I, I reject that and I repudiate it. But I do believe, more than I believe, I know that there is a creative energy force within all of us. It's not supernatural. It's not something outside of us. It's just each of us started as one cell. And today we're about 100 trillion of them. Something really creative went on inside of us and we did it ourselves. We started as one cell and we created ourselves and all living things did the same thing. And the and all life on earth started as one life form, we believe, and then evolved into all of this. So there's something incredibly creative going on. Our ancestors had no clue what it was. So they personified it and said, it's God. Today we know there seems to be something inherent in everything that seems to want to uh, create, expand, but it's not an external force by any means. And so I understand religion to be that way. And also to unite us, as my father used to say, with, with our the best self that we could possibly be, is to tie us into what we could become. Nothing supernatural about it. So does religion serve a useful purpose? If you define religion in that way, it clearly does. What is the useful purpose? Well, either, even the atheists begrudgingly acknowledge that it serves a useful purpose. They just think that if it's tied in with a supernatural God, the negative outweighs the good. But I'll give you one of my favorite quotes by Einstein. And you can't say that he wasn't really all that scientific or was, was kind of dumb. He said, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. So he believed that science required religion. He believed that all art, music, culture was based on religion, but his definition of religion was similar to mine. He believed that uh, he called himself a, 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 a non-religious believer. Now, now, actually, I'm messing up the quote, but he, <laughs> he, but he said that his, his religion was basically an acknowledgement of, the, of an awesome, wondrous power uh, throughout this universe. But again, he didn't think it was a personified power. So Einstein believed in that type of thing. And Carl Sagan, I think my time's got to be almost up, so I'm going to wind it up here. Um, you would concur with that, right, Sharon? I'm about up. Yes, you're almost up. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna also say that Carl Sagan also believes strongly that religion and science should be merged together, and he thought that science could increase and augment religion and could make religion better. He didn't see the day when religion would be wiped out. He thought it would make it better. So I'll turn it over to Dan now, and I'll just oh here's my quote from Sagan. Let me just finish with this. In some respects, science has far surpassed religion in delivering awe. How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought? The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. God must be even greater than we dreamed. Instead, they say, no, no, no. My God is a little God, and I want him to stay that way. And here's the best part of the quote as far as the topic tonight. A religion older new that stress the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe, hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Sooner or later, such a religion will emerge. So he did not look forward to the end of religion. He looked forward to religion being strengthened and made more accurate and more wondrous by science. And that's what I look forward to as well. Uh, Dan, we turn it over to you. Thank you, Barry. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the headquarters of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And most of you are in Florida somewhere, is that right? Is that yes. where your congregation is? I was in Iowa this weekend for a very sad uh, memorial, well, a celebration of life for a long-term colleague who died, um, Professor Bible, Bible professor Hector Avalos. And during my remarks, I mentioned that you and I are going to have this debate coming up. And you had, you had mentioned something to me a few weeks ago about some Hebrew words in Jeremiah, which I thought was interesting. And I was going to check with Hector, but I can't check with Hector. He's gone. He's, he, I mean, he's like the, he was my go-to guy. 
in any event, I said, I'm debating this rabbi and we agree on everything. So <laughs> what are we going to <laughs> what are we going to debate? You know, it's almost going to be like trying to nail Jello to a tree. What's uh, you know, what is what are we talking about here? And I guess we do have a, a point of disagreement, at least on the on the definition. And maybe tonight's uh, debate or conversation is going to boil down to, to definitions, really. And if you define things one way, you'll come out different. You know, like like Digo, you put what you put in is what comes out. William James, when he gave his famous Edinburgh lectures, um, the varieties of religious experience, um, he confessed that he could not find a definition of a religion that we could agree on. He said, you can come up with one, I can come up with one, someone else is going to come up with another. And so he said, uh, so let's, let me just define it the way I define it for the purpose of these lectures. And then he went ahead and did. And for him, uh, religion required some kind of transcendence, not just the common league and ligament of human beings coming together for some purpose, but for him, and I think for most people on the street, um, you're not a person on the street, Barry, you're a, you're a smart guy, but I think most people on the street, when they think of religion, what do they think about? What are we talking about? We're talking about a transcendent supernatural God being, and you even admit that, that you don't see it that way. So, if we take your definition, Barry, then basically you've defined or redefined or undefined the word religion to just mean science and the awe of existence and the awe of science, which all of us have. I don't call myself religious, although I share with you all of those same sentiments, the sentiments that you quoted from, from Carl Sagan. So, um, so I guess that's our disagreement. I, I, according to your definition, I think the military could be a religion. The military has a community of people that have common values, they have rules, they have moral standards, they have a purpose of individual betterment and social betterment, and ultimately, I think, uh, trying to improve the world. Uh, what about the Girl Scouts? The Girl Scouts are a community, they have their rules, they have their standards of moral togetherness, they have their, their dinners and potlucks and fellowships and they're trying to improve the world for betterment and they they do their science walks and they you know are the girl scouts a religion i i think if we're talking about religion in, in in our organization the freedom from religion foundation we are careful to define religion as having some component some it's a system of beliefs and practices that claim to be responsive in some way or accountable in some way to something that's transcendent or supernatural in fact, the Jewish religion is based on scriptures, holy scriptures, that claim very clearly that there is this Yahweh, this being who's, who's an angry war god who's going to punish you and who's going to, you know what I mean, and you need to submit to him. And when I asked you, Barry, uh, a few days ago, how would you define the word worship, you responded with, with just, just two words. You, you responded with um, uh, submissive devotion or slavish devotion. That's the word you use, slavish devotion devotion. So if you're a slave, then you're a slave to something. If you're devoted, you're devoted to something. And so uh, I guess I have to reject your watered down definition of religion because it, it makes it almost meaningless. It makes, um, you know, it, it would make me religious. And one way to show that, that I'm not religious, Barry, is I, I bet you, I, I don't know if you're a paid salaried person at your congregation, uh, but if you are, I bet you're taking advantage of the IRS housing allowance that allows you to exclude your housing from income. You and I have similar positions. Uh, is that true or am I out of line here? Uh, you are paid? Uh, yes, but I'm not that sophisticated financially okay. to know how to do that. If well, I okay, did, I probably I, would. <laughs> well, well you're, you're, you're cheating yourself of a lot of tax breaks if you don't know that. It's a, it's a great thing. <laughs> well, this is a good this is a good. Allowance. I'm glad we had this evening together. You're teaching me a lot about religion that I didn't know. Okay, but the point is, you and I are similarly situated. We are both kind of like leaders of our organization. We have 35, 36,000 members, and we educate, and we teach, and we have our, our communal gatherings, and we share values, and you know what I mean? We're kind, of, we're kind of similarly situated, but you get to take that break, and I don't, because you, according to the IRS, you are a religion, and our group is not. In fact, we sued the IRS over that, saying that's not fair. It doesn't seem fair that, you know, groups who do promote the idea of a, a God or transcendence, they get this break, 
the groups that don't, we don't get it. So I, I think you would probably agree with us. You would probably join us in that lawsuit on state church ground. But the point I'm trying to make is that there's got to be something different between you and me if you call yourself religious and I don't. And what is that difference? There's nothing, I, I think most religious people, uh, I think many religions are, are very useful in the world. They provide a sense of community and moral values. There's some entertainment there. That's useful. There's education. There's charity work. Uh, religion has art and music and architecture and all that. Those are great things that a lot of religious people do and a lot of congregations do. But none of those activities are exclusive to religion. Those are basically secular activities that your group is doing and my group is doing. It's basically a human science rational kind of activity. Religion used to be useful. Uh, religion was kind of the first science before we knew much. Religion was kind of our first stab. Now that we have science, we know that religion was really wrong. We know that the people who wrote those Hebrew scriptures were totally wrong in their cosmology, in their science, and in their understanding, and even in their moral values, uh, you know, celebrating genocide. I mean, what is Passover? It's a celebration of infanticide, basically. What is Purim? Purim is a celebration of Esther's wanting to massacre of thousands of people. You know, so you're, the, the moral values of this faith or this religion that you're adhering to, we can criticize on moral grounds because we've gone past that. And I think you have risen above all of that. And, and from what you just said about not thinking God is an actual supernatural being, I bet you I bet you are much nicer than the God of the scriptures on which your religion is based. And I'm sure you are. Uh, and I applaud you for that. I think you're thinking for yourself and thinking outside of that box. So um, I would say the, the main question you should ask about any religion, however you define it, is, is it true? If it's not true, then it's dangerous. If the claims that are being made are not actually truth, the factual claims, then it is a dangerous uh, religion and it should be discarded and it should be roundly criticized. And I, I would think you, Barry, would join me in soundly criticizing those words that are in the Hebrew scriptures that are horrible and ghastly. I mean, you should. You're a good man, and I'm sure you would. So uh, I, I agree with what you said earlier, uh, and that if you define religion as having a transcendent or supernatural then you don't think it serves you, you think it serves uh, less of a useful purpose than more and on balance we should discard it and i it seems to me like you're discarding what i consider to be religion and we're only on the only page that we're not on is how we define that word religion <laughs> so i think that's about 10 minutes isn't it yeah, yes you have one time. more minute yeah oh that's fine <laughs> i will cede to my distinguished colleague <laughs> well, well dan i gotta say that you uh, you seem to argue my point and i seem to argue your point <laughs> so i guess we're doing pretty well you're, you're saying that religion does do serve some useful purposes and i'm saying that um religion does a lot of bad things and i don't believe in a supernatural being so we're, we're uh, you know before this happened i had a chat with dan and i said oh my gosh what are we going to disagree about and, and we kind of went down the line. We agreed on almost everything, except for the freedom from religion. And it really comes down to a definition. And I don't want to be anti-semantic. I mean, I, I think that if we're, all we're arguing about is a definition, then we're really not arguing about a whole lot. Yeah. But let me just, uh, let me share a response to, to the definition. I don't know how, how useful that is, but let me, let me just share for you why Judaism is different than the Girl Scouts or the military. And by the way, you said that you you would hope that I would criticize some of the excesses and the cruelty of God and the Torah. I do it to excess to the point that people in my congregation say, all right, already, we get the message. <laughs> God did a lot of bad stuff. You don't have to tell us every week, we get it. So yeah, I do believe in honesty. I do believe that religion has an obligation to atone for its sins. And I do believe that we should repudiate these things of the past. But just as I believe that we should repudiate them, uh, a scientist wouldn't say, you know what? We should get rid of science because they used to think in science that you could drill a hole in somebody's head and that would release evil spirits. Or they used to think that we should use bloodletting. Or Ptolemy used to think that the earth was in the center. So let's get rid of science. We don't do that. We allow science to grow and evolve but the people who don't really like religion don't allow religion the same courtesy. I can understand why, because a lot of religions don't. And a lot of them cling to barbaric practices and are doing horrible things. That doesn't mean that 
no religion possibly could evolve and change. So for instance, Einstein said that belief in God went through three phases. First, we thought he was really mean and nasty because we saw thunder and lightning and, and horrible plagues and earthquakes. And so we thought he just wanted blood and wanted to kill people. So we sacrificed animals to cure his bloodlust so he wouldn't come after us. And then we imagined God to be a father figure. He would reward the good and punish the bad. You can see that all over the Torah. You can see both of these things in the, in the Bible. And then he said, now today we get a glimpse of this, this wondrous, amazing feeling and uh, natural beauty and it's enhanced by science. And he says, sometimes you're filled with a sense of awe and a, he called it a cosmic religious experience. And he saw that as the natural progression of God. So the Girl Scouts don't have a track record of, a, of believing in a deity and then trying to understand it, nor does the military. Judaism does. I would agree with you, Dan, on a lot of different religions. Like Christianity doesn't really have that. Christianity is pretty much based on you got to believe in Jesus. And if not, there's really no point. And if you want to be Muslim, you kind of have to believe in the revelations of Muhammad. Otherwise, it's not much point. Judaism is a little bit different. In Judaism, you could have a belief that's separate and independent from a literal view of God and still have reason to be Jewish. So what, what is it about Judaism that makes one religious? It has a moral code, which I'll agree with you, Dan, it started out pretty bad, but it's been evolving and changing ever since. It's a way of looking at the world and trying to figure out our place in it. It's trying to understand how we fit. It's transcendent in that Judaism of the past believed that there was a transcendent being. And we tried to see the universe through that transcendent being's eyes. Today, we still try to get a cosmic perspective, but instead of using a transcendent being to see the world, we use what Carl Sagan said, he turned the Voyager back on us and looked at us from a cosmic perspective and saw a pale blue dot. But the, the purpose or the goal was the same. He wanted to get a transcendent view. So when you say transcendent, I would say, yes, Judaism, even without the supernatural, is transcendent. We try to transcend the world by looking at it beyond our own needs and our own self and see how do we fit in? How do we connect? How do we, how does the, how do we fit with the universe and what's our role in it? And that way it's transcendent. And so we accomplish the same thing as our ancestors, but I don't- 30 about, seconds. Thanks. For, Thank you. I don't throw out the baby with the holy water. Instead, I take the good from the past and I allow it to evolve as science has. And I'll say this, the solution to bad government is not no government, it's good government. The solution to bad medicine isn't no medicine, it's good medicine. And the solution to junk science, which we see all over the place, is not no science, it's good rational science. Fine. So, yeah, we non-believers, if I can call us a group even, uh, people like you who believe in science do have all those feelings, the feeling of awe, the goosebumps, just the amazing discoveries that science has made, looking at the universe, looking back at that pale blue dot. We all get those things. Sometimes we, we get tears when we think about them. This, this feeling of awe that gives this illusion of transcendence. I agree with you. There is an illusion that we are kind of somehow outside of ourselves. I play jazz piano. And I, when, I play, when I'm playing with a good band, improvised piano, a good bassist, a good drummer, we're in the middle of a tune. Suddenly something magical happens. It's like, Whoa, it, it, there's this illusion that there's something above and beyond us, that there's a, something greater than the sum of the parts. There's this gestalt thing that happens, and I'll get goosebumps, and the music seems to be like this big capital S song that's up there, and all of us know that it's an illusion. We all know that, but it's an illusion to live for. I mean, it's, we love those moments. It's just like, it's, it's almost glorious, if I can borrow a, a religious word. But none of us are pretending that there really is this big thing up there outside of us. It's something that happens in our brain when we are confronted with, like the first time you step up, step to the edge, not off the edge, step to the edge of the Grand Canyon and look across there, this feeling of just sort of, whoa, what is this? You know, we all have that. I don't call that religion. 
I, I do know when I was a believer, I had those experiences when I was contemplating God. So I can see the parallel. If you're having these experiences and you have this God person in your brain, well, then it's easy for you to think, well, then their God is real because it feels real. But it's an illusion. It's, I mean, we're all going to die. Our brains are going to decay. And whatever, these, whatever this consciousness upon consciousness is happening level upon level that gives us these feelings of transcending ourselves or even the idea of the self, that's going to go away someday. But for now, it is beautiful. And so I applaud that. There are millions of people, tens of millions of people in this country who don't believe in God or religion or faith or anything transcended in any supernatural world, who live happy lives, moral, productive, meaningful, you know, loving, charitable lives without calling ourselves religious. And in our minds, religion is something that if you, if you, have, to, if you have to qualify it with a word like religious, then you are diminishing it. To say religious awe, religious feelings, religious view, you are you are qualifying something that doesn't need to be qualified. It can just be human. It can just be real. It can just be the, the word that we live in. You said that some of your congregants were tired of you criticizing God, saying, yeah, God did some bad things. But when they say that to you, what do they mean by God? Why, what, what's even in their brains? They must be thinking of a being when they are either approving or objecting to you criticizing this quote unquote God, I think in the mind of any of your congregants, this God is not just a metaphor. It is a real being of some sort. And you probably allow them to think that, I, you know, because you, you probably allow for some diversity like in Unitarians. So those of us who are not religious, the open atheist, agnostic and secular humans, we lack nothing by not calling us religious. And if you want to put a label on it, I mean, there's a tree outside my window. I guess you could put a label on it and call it religion. You could do that. Fine. But it's still a tree. The, uh, reality is reality. The cosmos is the cosmos. Awe is awe. Feelings are feelings. And we can all participate in those without religion and without the idea that um, we, have to be bond we have to be in an in-group that's different from the out-group. And if there's anything we know from history, religion... If not, even if it's true, it is divisive. Religion creates so much tension in the world, which we would be much better off without. You know, um, I think that what I'm going to do, if it's all right with you, Dan, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to alter the structure a little bit. Instead of uh, I'm an attorney, so I know how to interrogate. But instead of interrogating you, I think what I'd like to do is just allow us each to respond to what each other six. I'd like to respond to what you said, and then you can respond to what I said, maybe take another few minutes and then open it up for questions, if that's all right with you. That's fine, sure. Okay, good. Um, first of all, I agree with pretty much everything you're saying. I, I certainly don't suggest, as some do, that you have to be religious in order to feel a sense of awe, to be moral, to lead a good life, or to be in touch with the transcendent. I would never suggest that. My position is that religion enhances that. Now you call it illusion. You say, well, you know, we're playing music and there's some kind of illusion. I don't call that illusion. I'm not sure what you're referring to as illusion. To me, we're actually getting in touch with what makes life wondrous. There's, there's something wondrous about life and it's not supernatural. It's that if you just think about life and you think about how spectacular it is that there's a, a ball of fire 93 million miles away and some organisms are channeling that energy and turning it into growth that, that we can consume and, and the miracles that happen every day. And just the way music works, the way that you can hit notes and chords and different instruments and play beautiful music, this is real. This is describing something real in the universe that we can tap into and utilize. So to me, it makes it beautiful and wondrous, but it doesn't require a supernatural being. Now, what religion does religion allows us to organize that. So in Judaism, for instance, we have music and words that go back thousands of years. It takes us in touch with people who have been trying to figure out what's going on for a very, very long time, and it connects us. And when we're connected with a group of people trying to do that, it's an amazing thing. Like if you're a Girl Scout and you go around selling cookies and you make a few bucks, that's good. But if you do it in connection with the Girl Scouts, and now they're all doing that, and they all have meetings and they all take that money and they do a good purpose and they're encouraging each other, you can do it better. So you do not need religion to feel a sense of awe and wonder and transcendence at all, but I think it enhances it and it helps you to do it better. And that sense of goosebumps that you get 
religion done properly could, could encourage that and make it happen more often and also channel it in a positive direction instead of no direction. So for instance, in, uh, in science, and that's why Einstein said that science without religion is lame because what religion is also, it's a moral guide. Now, Dan, you're gonna say, what's well, a horrible moral guide? And I will say to you, 3000 years ago, perhaps it was, but there were also some incredible things in the moral guide 3000 years ago. And if we stand on each other's shoulders and build upon it and join together and try to figure out what's right and wrong and use reason, then we can do much better as, as a moral guide than just each one of us making it up as we go along. So for instance, you say all is one, it's all unity. Well, Judaism is based on the Shema, which says that this power behind everything is one. There's antecedents in Judaism that feed into what you're saying. And it's also something that's part of our people for thousands of years. And so done rationally and allowed to evolve, religion can enhance this feeling. I think I'll leave it there and then I'll turn it over to you, Dan. You get a chance now to respond to me or bring up other points and then we'll turn it over to uh, others to ask questions or to uh, share some of their thoughts. It's all yours. So I think you're right, Barry. Religion, for some people, can enhance the experience. It gives a, a layer of something, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> uh, in my, my family is Native American. You can see some of the images back here. We're part of the Lenape tribe, the original Manhattan tribe, the Lenny Lenape. And when I, when I remember my grandfather singing some of those sort of Indian hymns and things, I didn't believe in the creation myths of my grandfather. I didn't believe that there was a turtle that floated in the water and brought up the mud and created the continents. That's, that's a cute story. Uh, and, and you find those stories across the American continent, which, by the way, were on this continent at least 15,000 years ago, which was what? 12,000 years before the Israelites claimed the copyright to the Ten Commandments. I mean, they, they were living good moral lives, happy lives without any of this idea of some deity, Abrahamic or whatever, just living their good family lives with their tensions, of course. But when I heard granddad sing those songs and do his bead work, I did feel a connection. Like you say, with your Jewish identity, you feel a connection with the song, the hymns that grandma used to sing, right? I don't get the same feeling listening to Jewish hymns that you do, right? You probably wouldn't get the same feeling listening to my granddad's bad singing of some of those Native Americans. But, but it's my family. It's beautiful to me. And so I, I understand that. There's a sense of, like you say, the ligament, the league, the binding of us together because of a common beauty. But uh, like you, I don't, I don't really believe in the, the original turtle that created the continents and all that. That's just a myth from really well-meaning but ignorant minds and it's I'm, I'm glad to see that some religious believers go that far to even say that when when i'm playing in a jazz band and i'm getting this feeling of whatever gestalt or transcendence or illusion illusion is the word i use and illusion happens a lot illusion can be a good thing actually a depth perception is an illusion there's lots of illusions that are we have in our life that we embrace we call them good uh, free will, I think, is an illusion. And, and, and it doesn't exist, but we have the illusion, and so that's a whole different debate. But none of us in the band think there actually is a capital S song out there. We really we, we see it, we envision it, but we don't really think it's out there. It's within our brains. It's inside of us. And these experiences that we're having of awe or whatever, uh, you know, sometimes I'll have this feeling that uh, there's this parental person in, above giving me guidance and comfort. That's really a nice feeling. But I know that all of those feelings are happening inside the brain and they don't necessarily point to anything outside of the brain. So transcendence can be used two different ways. You used it in a natural way. You know, I mean, we could say that um, music theory transcends melody. I mean, we could use the word transcend in all sorts of different ways, not just supernatural and natural. So are you suggesting that if the Girl Scouts were to call themselves a religion, they would somehow be better than they are? You think they would be improved at calling themselves a religion? No, they would be inaccurate because they don't meet the definition of a religion. But I just wanted to let you know something, Dan. Um, I do believe that all religions should be transformed from the tribal to the cosmic. And I do share your love for Native American culture. In fact, both of my sons 
I gave Native American names. And I do have a great respect for Native American religion. And like you, I don't believe it's true, but they seem to be in touch with the earth. And I think that if that feeling towards the earth were to have evolved till today, and we didn't wipe out the culture like we did, could have evolved into something very beautiful. There still is a Native American culture, but it's been decimated. And so I, I think it's great that we can tap into different cultures and uh, different groups. Um, I do wanna open it up for other people and uh, let them, here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna confine you to a question because we're not gonna insult your intelligence and act like you have nothing to say and all you can do is ask. But I will ask you to try to limit it to one minute, a statement, a question, or a statement and a question, whatever you'd like to do. Take a minute and if you'd like to end it up with a question, that's great. So let's turn it over to others and then Dan and I will get a crack at ending this at the end with a concluding uh, five minutes. Okay, so uh, Sharon, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. And maybe you can find people who want to share something. Harris some. has his hand up. Before Harris talks, there's a lot of chat going back and forth. So perhaps after Harris talks, we might want to read some of the chat um, okay. comments that you might have seen. So go ahead, Harris. All right, Dan, I believe in a lot of what you have to say. But in our country, Jews are less than 1% of the population. But 50% of the owners of the NBA happen to be Jewish. And Jews in our country are very successful. So what do you attribute that to? And I believe what you believe. Well, I think you're right. There's something special about Jews in America, uh, in our history. Most of my favorite songs were written by Jews, cultural Jews. George Gershwin was Jewish, but he didn't believe Neither did his brother Ira. Irving Berlin was an agnostic. He was culturally right. Jewish, but he never went to synagogue. Yip right. Harburg, who wrote Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Said I agree. That, he said, uh, the theater is my temple. Uh, a whole bunch of these secular Jews who, who didn't, they weren't even married in a religious ceremony. And yet there's something special about their art, their uh, observation, their talent. Jerome Kern, a German Jewish um, songwriter, probably the father of, a, of American uh, theater, Jerome Kern was also a non-believer. And um, he was almost going to get on the Titanic, uh, on the Lusitania, excuse me. He was almost going to get on the Lusitania that morning and he overslept mm -hmm. and he missed it. He, and one of his friends died from that. So, and then look at science and then look at law. Look at, uh, uh, you know, it, it seems to me, and I'm not going to make a stupid guess here. It seems to me that there might be some genetic, component to it. They're just a, a bunch of smart people. And maybe there's also a learned uh, having to scrabble for yourself kind of thing that came out of it as well. But I think we our, our world owes a lot to Jews. But I don't think it's because of the religion of Judaism. I think it's because of the culture. I think it's something to do with the culture, the, the values um, of, of, okay. of a particular group of people. Of course, it's not just Jews, but you're right. Jews seem to be overrepresented in this country. And and, um, and I, I think technically I'm Jewish because my mother's mother's mother was Jewish. She her last name was Sofer, which is a uh, I think it's a Hebrew word for scribe or for writer. <laughs> so I think technically I would be genetically Jewish, although I have no Jewish heritage at all. I mean, no. She was one of those um, what were they called? Conversos, Moranos. Yeah. yeah. In the in the in the American Southwest, uh, Sofer. Uh, and they were pretending not to be Jewish. And then her daughter, my grandma, didn't know they were pretending. They just thought she just grew up thinking she was Catholic or something. But uh, in any event. Um, well, let, uh, me re let me respond to uh, what Harris said. Um, as, a, as somebody who's a rational thinker, Dan, you probably would agree that it couldn't really, or the odds are that it's not a coincidence that an astounding number of people who have won Nobel Prizes, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the NBA, I mean, that's nice too, but I think more impressive, astounding number of people that won the Nobel Prize in science and literature, and philanthropy are Jewish. And Mark Twain, before there was even a Nobel Prize, mentioned that the Jewish people have excelled beyond all numbers, even with the world against them. And he asked, what is it that allows them to excel to such an extent? This could not possibly be just coincidence. And I think you hit upon it at the end. You said something about culture. 
But I would suggest to you that that really is an answer to the question that we're debating. It's more than just culture. It's the religion. There's something in the Jewish religion that brings out qualities in people that seem to place them in a, in a position where they can do much for the world. But let me just explain to you that what you might not know. In many cultures, and when you hit 13, you have a rite of passage and you have to kill an animal or you have to do some kind of feat of strength or something like that. In Judaism, it's education. You have to study. Our greatest hero was Moses who conquered, who spoke to God supposedly, who defeated Pharaoh, but he's known as Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses the teacher. Education is stressed, kindness is stressed, compassion is stressed. In the Jewish scripture, alongside the passages that you and I repudiate, it says to love the stranger as yourself. It says to, if you have a field, to not plow the whole field, let somebody come on your field and, and, and eat off of your field. It also gives a day of rest to animals. There are things in the Torah that far transcend anything we have today. And these things are best communicated through religion. Now, if we're fossilized in our religion and we're stuck with the good and the bad, and we have to take all the primitive passages, then I could agree with you, that would be a horrible thing. But what if, what if hypothetically we could get rid of all the bad stuff like science does, weed out things that are incorrect and just go with the good? Then Judaism could be even a better source. And that's what we do at our synagogue. We go with the good parts of it and the bad parts we take out because we don't believe that it was written by a divine infallible authority. And so we can pick and choose what makes sense and what doesn't. Uh, but not all Jews are like that. I mean, the Orthodox tend to be a lot different from your congregation. Oh, absolutely. And I uh, spend most of my, a lot of my time going after the challenging the ideas of the Orthodox. I think most of what the Orthodox do is really fossilized Judaism, and it and it's against the it's against the tide of what Judaism is really all about. Judaism's evolving, growing, adapting, and they're not. And uh, so I, I find them to be a negative force, and I think that's why they went for Trump, because Orthodox Jews, fundamentalist Christians, are used to believing on faith without evidence. They're used to following along their leader, and they're science deniers. And those people are a reservoir of gullibility for people like Trump and demagogues. And so I agree with you. I don't think they're a, a positive influence. They, they did preserve Judaism through difficult times, but today they're a retrograde force, I would say. We have, uh, a, hand raise, we have a hand raised. Bob Kay can go ahead. Hi, I'm Bob and uh, I happen to also be Jewish. Uh, but what, what I feel about my Judaism is that there was nothing uh, forced upon me other than getting bar mitzvahed. That was the major thing I had to do. And uh, I, I think that uh, now that, that in, in my later years of my life, I've, I've uh, welcomed atheism. Uh, I see there are a lot of Jewish people that, that uh, are kind of agnostic or, or non-believers. And I can understand why. Uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff. I mean, I've, I've seen, seen what happened in uh, Germany. 98% uh, of uh, Germany was uh, national religion, just like there is here. Uh, why would I want to be a part of that? Uh, but, uh, what I do feel, uh, what is religion doing to make the transition? Uh, I, I see that you're doing it, Barry, uh, but you are, to me, like uh, not, not widespread. Uh, you're unique. Uh, most, most people in religion, it's, it's all about God and, and the supernatural. Uh, I feel if, if, if religions took that away, uh, what would people do? What would people do all of a sudden without a replacement? Uh, take it upon themselves that they're, they're acting in, 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 on, on God's uh, word and, and they're doing it. It could even be worse than, than having religion. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, 
need to be to be discussed and and, and put in place. Uh, and, and and as far as quoting Einstein, I I I do believe Einstein was a an atheist, uh, a, what you might call a full blown atheist. Uh, you know, and uh, he does get misquoted sometimes. But uh, so uh, um, that's. But Bob, thank you for sharing. You've brought up a lot of good points and I really appreciate your participation. Let me turn it over to Dan and then I'll respond to what you said. Dan, go ahead, take a crack at it. So Bob, um, I think you and I are very much alike. I think you are viewing or treating your proud Jewish heritage much in the same way I, I view and treat my proud Native American heritage. It's something that we love, we admire, we respect our ancestors, um, we don't believe the literal stories, and I don't even know if my granddad believed, I'm sure he didn't believe them, but they were stories, they were fables, you know, the, the, the Garden of Eden is a fable. If you look up the word fable in the dictionary, it's a moral tale that involves talking animals. So there you go, a talking snake and a, uh, Aesop's fables, or, or animals talking or acting like humans. So, um, so I can see that in... Um, I don't know if I've, my Native American heritage motivates me in any moral philosophy. There's no moral philosophy in, in the scriptures either. Uh, the only moral philosophy there is submit and obey to the authority of this jealous God. And that's basically it. And, um, but um, uh, I, I think I understand what you're saying. And you, you, I think you are suggesting, Bob, that those of us who don't call ourselves religious are not lacking anything. We're atheists, we're agnostics, we reject the whole idea of religion, not culture, not identity, not heritage, not awe, not beauty, but this whole idea that there has to be a, an in-group of certain people. If the Native Americans had not been pretty much wiped out by at least a 90% genocide through war and disease, people coming over onto this continent with a gun in one hand and a Bible in the other, Perhaps we would have had a few more Nobel laureates among our, our ranks as well. Who's to know what would have happened? If, um, and I do know that the natives who have survived, many of them are quite bright. So um, it's hard to go back and undo history, though. Um, I do want to respond to what you said, Bob, because I agree with a lot of what you said as well. Uh, first of all, I do remember the quote now from Einstein. He said he was a deeply religious non-believer. And what that means is that he was filled with a sense of awe and wonder and, and science enhanced it. But you are, I agree with you hundred percent. Einstein was very, very clear. He did not believe in a supernatural being. He used God as a metaphor and said, God doesn't play dice and things like that. But he totally rejected a personal God and certainly the God of the Torah. He thought it was mythology. And I agree with you about that. I believe that the Torah is a lot of mythology and if you confuse myth from reality, you'll be myth-guided, myth-led, you'll myth-understand everything, and you'll be mythogenistic, and you'll myth the boat as far as what's really going on. So I agree with you. This mythology is nonsense. Now, I also agree with you about the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, it became much more difficult for Jews to believe in God. Elie Wiesel said, that one of the reasons why the Holocaust happened is because the rabbis told their people when things looked really bad, oh, don't worry, just pray to God. And if you pray hard enough, God's going to rescue you. And he said, while the Jewish people were praying in their synagogue, the synagogues were burnt down and they were carried off. So I believe that concept of God went up in ashes of the ashes of Auschwitz and was buried with the bodies of Babi Yar. I don't believe that rational Jews could ever think that there's a God watching over them. And that's why it's important to change the concept of God. Yisrael means struggle, one who struggles with God. And so if you struggle with God, if you challenge God, even if you don't believe in God, as long as you're thinking about it, then you're part of Yisrael. And so I think that we're tied in with a group of people from way back who are trying to figure it out God. Now, Dan, I will, I, I will disagree with you here. If you say all that's in the Bible, the only thing that it is, is just some angry God doing horrible things, you're, you're totally overlooking vast, vast passages 
like about 30 of them that say help the poor, allow them onto your land so that they can have something to eat if they can't feed themselves, the basic of the income tax, love the stranger as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. This is very, very advanced. Love the stranger and the foreign born as yourself because you were strangers to overlook that and say, well, it's no big deal. To give a day of rest to animals as they do on the Sabbath and say, yeah, no big deal. These are things that if you wanna look objectively at Judaism, then you have to say, yes, there's some horrors in it, but there's some also things in it that are extremely advanced. And it would be a shame to get rid of all of it and to destroy the Jewish religion and culture and to have that lost forever. Anybody else? We have Maureen. Maureen Hart, go ahead. Uh, to, I was going to first, um, which I will do, comment on awe and transcendence and uh, using that as proof of some spiritual nature that is influencing us with the new um, advanced brain imaging, MRIs. It's absolutely scientific, scientifically shown that this transcendence is a result of, of sensory uh, reactions. You can actually see parts of the, of the brain glowing to uh, music or the pictures of art. And uh, even, it goes down, they've tried this even on dogs and uh, on uh, chimpanzees. And they can glow also with uh, the sound of their master's voice or the smell of a, of a favorite treat so that awe and transcendence is part of nature. It, there's nothing supernatural about it. We, we respond automatically to beauty, to, to music, to art, to sunsets and all of that. And then just the last thing you said, Barry, about um, uh, what was the point you made? Um, uh, good things in the Bible. Yes, um, that the golden rule has all the empathy for the stranger and the poor and the sick and all that. And it, it certainly predates uh, the Bible. So look, you, could have all, those same, you could have those same uh, motivations and models without having uh, the Bible. What golden rule are you talking about? I mean, what do Jesus unto said? others, do unto others. And yeah. it doesn't say just to others that we know to one to others. And so uh, I think that that covers more than than even the specifics of the poor and the prisons and and that to one to all others as you would have. Yeah. Uh, Dan, go ahead. You want to take a crack at that? Then I'll respond. <clears throat> well, um, I guess I'll repeat what I said earlier. We all, most of us, I, I guess maybe there's some people at the tail end of the curve who may not have feelings of awe, but I think most of us do in some way or another. And with some of us, it's greater than with others. Uh, we all have that. And you can put a label on it if you want. You can call it religious awe if you want to, but it's still awe. I think that calling it religious awe cheapens it. I think it's like trying to explain something that doesn't need to be explained. I think it's just because if religion is that which binds people together like a ligament if that's what it is then if i'm walking out on the beach by myself and i get those feelings of awe and transcendence with the birds and there's no there's no religion binding me to anything i'm just enjoying and appreciating this world so um and and i do have some books uh maureen that talk exactly about that about what's happening in the brain when you're going through not just those feelings but other types of like listening to music and that uh, that uh, and I don't think Barry's even making any different kind of claim himself. I think he's agreeing that what's happening in the brain is in the brain, and that whatever we want to call it an, an illusion or a, a, a transcendence or whatever you want to call that feeling we have, it's a very natural human experience. Yeah, um, it's definitely not supernatural, but just because we're capable of doing something on our own, which we are doesn't negate the fact that if we do it with a group with people who have been trying to do this for thousands of years and have a collective body of how to do it, that that wouldn't be helpful. Like for instance, I like to play tennis. I go out and I hit off the ball off the wall and, and I can do pretty good on my own. But if I go to a coach and if that coach has been trained by other people over generations, and if I have an organized way of playing, 
it enhances it. It's a lot more fun playing with a group, playing in a league, playing with a coach. I can do it better. Yes, you, you can go outside and feel a sense of awe, but what if, what if there's a series of, of literature, of music, of words that have special meaning that have been crafted over the, the eons? What if you have a collective group of people engaged in doing good for the world who believe that their mission in life, their purpose, which we all need a sense of purpose, just by being born into this heritage, your purpose is to make the world better. What if you belong to a heritage that says that within each of us is a spark of something sacred? What if you believe that each one of us is born good and pure instead of born evil? What if you believe that each one of us can accomplish great things? Not everybody shares this belief. The Jewish people does. And Abraham, the first Jew, I don't even know if he lived, but according to tradition, he saw a bunch of different people, different races, different colors, different forces in nature. And he said, it's all one. This is all interconnected. And, and our goal is to see the unity and everything like Dan was talking about. What if we have a heritage that teaches that and shows us how to do it over the years. And what if we could refine it so we can do it better and better and better and see the unity in everything? Sure, you could do it on your own, but you could do it so much better. And what if you wanted to try to do good for the world on your own, but instead of that, you had thousands and millions of people over the thousands of years working together to make this world better. It's a powerful, powerful feeling. And it's a good influence. Anybody else? Um, Krista Burks, I see. It doesn't look like Krista. Yeah, I think it's Steve Frank had his hand raised earlier. So I'm going to call on Steve Frank. Okay. And we'll then Krista, everywhere. then Mr. Burks, not Krista, <laughs> after that. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Unmute yourself, Stephen. Okay, okay can now, you hear me? Now, now we really, can hear you. I'll be real brief. Uh, I was raised as an Orthodox Jew. I was bar mitzvahed. I davened with the men in morning prayers. My wife and I were on the board of directors of the Hebrew school and were very uh, participants involved with the Hebrew school. And uh, as I became older, I realized I wanted to be a better person and I could not be a better person being religious. I, I, I love uh, Barry's uh, expression about fossil religion, but there's still a lot of fossil religion around. As a non-religious person, I can look at Israel, as a Jew, I can look at Israel and say, it's horrible what they're doing to Palestinians and, and not feel guilty about it. I just feel, as a non-religious person, I'm a better human being. And that's the way I feel. It took a long time for me to realize it, but that's where I am now. Yeah, well, let me respond to that because if all I knew of Judaism with Orthodox Judaism, I'd share your view. I'd say, this is horrible. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to- But, but it's not just Judaism. I'm not just talking about Judaism. I'm talking about all the other religions. The things right. that are going on right now. But, uh, I, I see a better world without religion. I, I mean, well, that's the way I feel. It would be a more peaceful world. The people would get along better. I, I just can't see a place of religion. And it took me a long time to realize that. And I'm in a real good place now. Well, let me let me try to put you in an even better place. Okay. okay. Are, are you reformed, Barry? You're no. reformed? No. My father was a what classically you, trained. But huh, my dad was you a sound reformed. Leader. You sound yeah. very reformed. Yeah, very reformed. <laughs> right, you did. Um, I, I'm more than reformed. Um, the reformed Jews have veered away from reform, which means constantly changing, and they stop changing. I am. I call what I do cosmic Judaism based on the teachings of Einstein. It's a type of Judaism that tries to connect us with the cosmos and everything else. So I, 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 have a, I come from a science background also. So. Okay, so let, let me just share something with you. Um, let's say that you were raised Orthodox and you think Orthodox is a negative influence. 
And let's say you went to a bunch of conservative synagogues, you thought they were too. And let's say you went to Reconstructionists and Jewish Renewal and a bunch of others, and they were bad too. Would that mean then that there's no possible way or no possible place where Judaism could be practiced in a way which would be positive? I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I would respond to orthodoxy the same way. But I humbly, I humbly submit to you, you're really not in any position to say that it's impossible that there could be a form of Judaism that would not only be acceptable to you, but that would be positive because you haven't experienced it. You haven't experienced what we do. You don't even know what we do. So for me to say, well, all religion is bad is exceptionally prejudicial and biased. And it's not based on objective reality. And it's not based on being um, scientific or rational because you don't know all the different forms of Judaism that, that are possible. And so and I just also want to mention something about, uh, you know, I was raised by a father who was one of the sweetest, kindest rabbis I ever met. And his expression of Judaism was so loving and so positive and so endearing. And people loved him and they loved to listen to him. And when they heard him, their lives were changed around and they, and they became better people. I know what Judaism can do. I know that Judaism can be in harmony with reality and with logic and reason and science. I know that. I've seen it. And so, yes, there's a lot of types of religion, maybe most of them. Maybe if, if I were to say on average, is the, would, would the world be better without religion? Maybe, but I would say maybe it would be better without government. There's a lot of horrible governments, including in Florida where we have Death Santis who's doing horrible things. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, there's a lot of horrible governments, but would the world be better without government? Maybe, maybe not, but I'll tell you this, the world would be much better with good governments. And the world would be much better with good religions, with people aligned together, trying to get in touch with something beyond themselves to make the world better. I do want to say something about the Palestinians just very briefly, because I can't really let it go. And I don't want to devolve into that, because that's absolutely and, nothing to do and, with what we're talking about. And it's very about. difficult for me also, because I have a friend who's an Israeli who absolutely hates Palestinians. Okay, and let, let me just, let I me can, And, let and me I feel bad. For, I, my parents are Holocaust survivors. They went through Germany. They knew what it's like to be treated like garbage. Yes. And for these Israelis to go to, to be, live in Israel and, and treat Palestinians the way they were treated is beyond my thinking. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. It's Hey, you know what? There's no need to apologize. At Lador Vador, we love getting different opinions. That's why we have Dan on, and that's why we invite difference of opinions. And I'm glad to hear you say that because it shows that you're a Jewish person, even though you don't practice Judaism perhaps anymore, you still have a sensitive heart and you still hearken to love the stranger as yourself and the foreign born. And that's why, Dan, you might've noticed, well, these Jewish people are secular, but they're doing good things. That's because they were brought up with a Jewish mentality and a Jewish milieu and a Jewish culture. It's not a coincidence. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, I do not appreciate what the Orthodox are doing in Israel. I find the settlers very unsettling. I think they're irrational. I think they're an impediment to a peace process. And I think they give the rest of the Jewish people a bad name. However, when you say, well, the way Jews treat the Palestinians is horrible. I'm just trying to figure something out here. Israel has been attacked by enemies about five or six times, who wanted to drive them into the sea and said that they were going to finish okay. off with Hitler. This so is, let me finish. This has let been me finish. going on let me finish. since let me finish. 1000 BC, let me... where one group after another has tried to take over the land of Israel, Canaan. I, let I let mean, me finish. It, it's been happening since 1000 BC, and it's still happening. I would think people are smart enough to realize they can live in peace if they just talk to each other. They don't want peace. They don't let want me, it. The Israelis me, don't Steve, want Steve, peace. Let me, Steve, let, let, me, let, let me Rabbi finish. Speak. Let me sorry, finish. sorry. Now I, I will apologize. strongly, now I will strongly and vehemently disagree with you. When Israel was founded in 48, they said to the Palestinians and the surrounding Arab nations, we want to live in peace and we want to create in the Middle East a paradise with our Semitic brothers and sisters. And the, and the neighbors and the Palestinians responded by saying, we're going to finish off what Hitler started. We're going to destroy you and drive you into the sea. A, few, a little while later, they did it again and again and again and again and again. And they constantly 
tried to destroy Israel and wipe out the Jewish people. There was no place where Jews were safe, no place in the world where Jews were safe. And the, during the Holocaust, they couldn't get anywhere. They were rejected from the United States and sent away. So I don't begrudge the Jewish people having a tiny little oasis of dignity, decency, and democracy in the Middle East where they can be safe and have their own land. There's like 40 different Muslim countries. There's 40 different Christian countries. To have one Jewish state, I don't begrudge them. And I also tell you this, that if the United States had a population living within us and living around us who were committing terrorist acts and blowing up schools and blowing up discos and blowing up restaurants and committing terrorist acts and killing people at the Olympic games and doing all these horrible things. I guarantee you those people would be treated uh, but, a million but, times, uh, let me finish, a million okay, times worse, a million times worse than the Jews okay. treat the Palestinians who don't even have a death penalty for the Palestinians, where the Palestinians are in the parliament, where the Palestinians have more rights than they do in any surrounding country. But that's not what we're talking about today. So let's talk about something else. Uh, all right, can I, all right, can I just say one thing? Sure. But it's, yeah, but it's okay for Israelites to go into Palestinians' homes and throw them out of their own homes. That's okay. About, that, yeah, if they're that's about to fine, yeah. right? That, yes, that's if not a problem. Yes. You don't have a problem with that. No, be I have a big, because, I have a big... because the Bible says that it's Israel's land. No. So no, I have, I have... Palestinians have been living there all this time, get thrown out of their own homes. And a... okay, that's the right. It, it's my religion. Come on, Barry. I, I have a big problem with people being tossed out of their house. But Hamas, the they Palestinians... They do it all the time. The it's Palestinians, happening now. It's happening now. And if you Pal stay, it's not. You're just burying your head in, in, this, in the sand. Because okay. it is happening. We, we need to... No, I'm, no, Steve, I am going to answer that. Rabbi and Steve, that. we need to... We have yeah, other no. people that want to talk. Okay, We're going to move sorry. on. No, my, my head is, no, no, my head is coming out of the sand because the Palestinians elected a terrorist group to represent them. And when Israel goes into a house, it's because they're harboring terrorists who are about to launch a terrorist strike on the Jewish people and kill innocent people. And the days where Jewish people are victims for the slaughter by people who are so vicious that they want to destroy the Jewish people, those days are over. And I do reject any settlers who come into Palestinian lands. I think it's a horrible thing. But if they're going to commit a terrorist act, there's going to be a consequence because Jews have a right to protect themselves. Okay, next. Okay, Chris, Mr. Burks. Oh, okay, I'll try to make this even more brief than that. Uh, <laughs> um, just a question here for the rabbi. Um, what's the difference between what you're saying and secular humanism? Uh, it sounds like you could be alongside Paul Kurtz and speaking about secular humanism. Um, it's just, uh, it, it seems like we're trying to um, <clears throat> keep the word religion alive because it means a lot to a lot of people. That's a, that is a sacred word and sacred thing for a lot of people. And for people to drop that you know, worldwide would be devastating. So I can kind of understand that. Are we just trying to water that down with secular humanism? That, um, that is, yeah, that, that's a very good question. There is not a vast chasm between me and what you would call a secular humanist. I share much in common with them. One of my favorite congregations is Beth Adam, atheist Jews. I, I love hanging out with atheists. I share pretty much much most of their values. Or, well, not, I shouldn't say values, but I share their their worldview, what separates me, and this occurred with at the atheist Jewish congregation, they have no sense of reverence, for instance, for the Torah or for the heritage or no sense of the, of one, the wondrous. I believe that we should celebrate what atheists call the numinous or the wondrous, the, what Einstein referred to as the, as the transcendent. I believe that this is something that makes life special. And to treat everything like it's just ho-hum, uh, that's, that's not for me. I think that there's something sacred in, in everything. But you could, I'm not all that different but what, from where the secular humans mm -hmm. come from, but I tie myself in to a Jewish people that mm -hmm. sought to <laughs> understand the universe and the power behind it and to figure out what's going on. And I cherish the Torah, not because it was written by God, it surely wasn't, unless like uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens says, unless he was having a really bad day. 
And I don't cherish it because it was written by God, but because it was written by people trying to figure out God. And I'm trying to figure out what is this wonderful thing beyond us. And I'll tell you this, I don't believe that matter is just matter. I don't believe that if you just look around and say, oh, it's just matter. There's something going on within everything that's wondrous and uh, is transcendent. And just like uh, Dawkins, when he said in Unweaving the Rainbow, just because we understand how it works, doesn't make it any less wondrous. And Einstein said, you can look at the world and the universe as if everything's a miracle or nothing's a miracle. And the more you know about the universe through science and uh, other ways, the more you realize everything is a miracle. And the secular humanists don't see it that way. I, I, I disagree I, with I you do. because I think, I think they do, is uh, uh, a lot of us atheists, uh, uh, humanists, um, we build our morality on secular morality, which is pretty much um, leading. Um, uh, see, religion is one step below, one step behind secular morality. Okay, Jerry Coyne said that, and I really think that's true because you know we we tend to uh, uh, we liberate um, um, the the slaves and. Um, and women's rights and um, all throughout the enlightenment uh, until today. <clears throat> uh, just as you said that you kind of discard all the bad things out of the, the Old Testament and you build upon all the good stuff. Well, that's kind of where secularism and humanism and the enlightenment um, kind of come from is that, well, you know what? It, this humanism, this everybody's created equal mentality um, that doesn't mean that we don't um, have reverence for the, the world. And uh, just like Dawkins said in the reading <clears throat> rainbow, which I've read, um, uh, it, there's, there's awe in it. And um, it, to me, it just, it, it just seems more, more like a secular humanism than, than, uh, than anything else. But uh, that's my opinion. Uh, Dan, I'm going to let you uh, respond. And then I, I'm going to make a quick response to that as well. <clears throat> so I'm an atheist, happy atheist and an agnostic depending on how you define the word God. And I am a humanist, a secular humanist as well. I belong to the AHA and I cooperate. We cooperate a lot with Center for Inquiry and Secular Humanism. And uh, Barry is right that all human beings are sharing in these feelings of awe and morality mm -hmm. and empathy, depending on, assuming you're mentally healthy, assuming you're not a psychopath or something. Uh, but I, I don't think what we secular humanists are feeling and experiencing in our community and our love is any less than what Barry is presenting. I don't think Barry or religious people or Jews have anything extra or above and beyond. Uh, I suppose if you want to devote your life to becoming an expert into something, you know, then, then you will have some ex extra knowledge. It's like music. Barry, you and I both like music, and I think most people here, you love music. Well, I'm a professionally trained musician, and I spend hours and hours and years and years in songwriting and music theory and playing with bands. And I think that enhances my understanding of music. But I'm not trying to say that, Barry, because you are not a perfect, I don't know if you are or not. I'm not trying to diminish your experience of, of loving music and enjoying life just because I happen to be more expert than you. I think we're hearing the same thing. I'm able to articulate it. Uh, and, and you seem to be suggesting that for a, a real authentic human being to truly enjoy the awe of life, we have to become part of some specialized group, some, some club that's going to bring us together to do that. I don't think it brings anything more to the table except that you can talk among yourselves. You can do shop talk among yourselves, which is okay. We, we, as musicians, we do shop talk among ourselves. But my wife scratches her head and says, what are you talking about? It sounds pretty. You know, Let's just enjoy life the way it is. Okay, well, uh, uh, first of all, like I said in the very beginning, I'll say it again. Uh, I have great admiration for atheists, and I'm, I've never suggested, nor would I, that atheists can't feel the same thing that religious people do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to make that clear. I also have boundless admiration for, for Dan, for, for running an organization that seeks to help cure mankind of the ills of religion, and I support it. I support it, and I, I think it's great that you're... Uh, outspoken, and I, I'm glad that you're outspoken with us too. Uh, so I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is like with music, if you, if you have a, a, a body of music and a study of music and a culture of music, 
I think it's going to enhance your ability to understand music and it's going to produce people that can do some pretty cool music as opposed to imagine if there was no music theory ever and nobody knew how to build upon anything else anybody ever did. And every each person just went out and said, hmm, I think I'm going to build a violin or I'm going to come up with a song. You know, it, it just helps when you do it together. I, I do want to say that with a secular humanism and there, there have been people who have been denigrated Ju Judaism, we're not denigrating it, but just saying, well, who needs it? You know, it's just like, you can be a good person without it. I want to share with you that Judaism, and I use this word guardedly, have faith. We have faith in things that the common person does not have. For instance, we have faith that if you will it, it is no dream. The Jewish people have accomplished incredible things through history by fighting for a good cause, including the reestablishment of Hebrew as a spoken language, which has never been done in the history of the world. A language that was dead came back to life. And Israel is now a Jewish state and is doing great things for, as a humanitarian state in the field of medicine and science. So Judaism believes in miracles. They say, if you don't believe in miracles, if, if a Jew has to believe in miracles to be a realist, that's something that Jews have faith in, that miracles can happen. Jewish people also have faith that you should love the stranger as yourself. That is not something that is universally accepted. That is not something that, oh, everybody believes in that, love the stranger as yourself. And it's part of our heritage. Not only is it part of our heritage, we have literature, music, and we have ways of inculcating this into our people every week. We, if, you, if you have a, if you want to be a good person, but you don't have a way of doing that in an organized structural way or of reinforcing it, it's not going to be as effective. We do things every week to constantly remind ourselves. We believe as a matter of faith that there's a sacredness about every person. Not everyone believes that. Not everyone believes that all people are sacred. We, in our tradition, thousands of years ago, said, don't stand idly by the blood of your neighbor, because if you don't speak up, you share in their iniquity. Not everyone believes it. Not everyone does it. Most people don't. Most people, if there's something bad going on, they just say, well, it's not my problem. In Judaism, if you don't get involved and speak up, it is your problem. You're involved in their guilt. I'm not saying all Jews do that. What I am saying is that we have a body of morality that's based on that. And just imagine for a minute if we could build on that and do better each generation. I believe it has the potential to do great good. Does that mean that you have to do that? No. Does that mean that if you're an atheist, you can't be good? No. It just means that we have an organized structure to try to create or uh, produce people who have purpose and meaning to make the world better. And I can't for the life of me see how that could be a bad thing if it was done in a rational way. Um, Rabbi, anyway. we, said we have Carol Anderson with her hand raised for a while. Um, we're getting on to an hour and 20 minutes now. I think that'll be the last person that we can take. That and then we have a wrap up. Go ahead. Go ahead, Go ahead Carol. Carol. Okay, thank you. I'll be very brief. I think I have an advantage here in that I have been in several different religious modes in my life. And about, uh, what is it now, 18, 19 years ago, I converted to Judaism. And I see the great breadth of which uh, Rabbi Barry speaks, uh, that you don't have to take a creed as fixed. In fact, we are, we are commissioned to wrestle with God and to make a difference in the world. And I feel very strongly that I, well, obviously I wanted to join this group with this commission, and I'm really glad I did. However, I would hope that we don't all split hairs here because I think all of us are pretty much on the same page into what we think is the scope of the universe and what we feel ought to be done. Uh, you can combat it from many different ways, but we're unified in, in believing in a wholeness of, of, of the universe and in a need to enhance human life. So let's not to tear ourselves apart with arguments about the most important things that we must be committed to and peace. <laughs> very, very well said. Um, Dan, I'll leave it to you. Would you, to wrap up, would you like to go first or second? 
Well, we could uh, cast the Purim, right? Cast the lots to see how that works. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't mind going first if you. Well, Dan, okay. I just want to share with you something about Purim. Okay, so Purim, like a lot of Jewish holidays, has a, a, a positive side and an ugly side. The positive side is Mordecai refused to bow down to authority. He challenged authority, and everybody else was bowing down, and he said, "No, not doing it. I I don't bow down to any human beings." And we've been defiant, not just with Mordecai, but ever since. The end of it is ugly. The Jews commit a massacre, but that's why we repudiate modern Jews repudiate that part. And, and accept the good part. By the way, Esther and Mordecai are the versions of a Jewish version of Ishtar and Marduk. And it's really a Persian morality play that was transferred into Judaism, just like Samson and Delilah, Shimshon and Delilah. Shimshon is the sun and Delilah is the night. It's a, it's a play between good and, and evil. But I, I agree with you, Dan. The, the story as it ends up is ugly and should be um, rejected. But Dan, so I'll, I'll leave it to you if you'd like to go first or second. Yeah, I'll go first. But first, let me just respond. Yeah. I don't think Mordecai was the real hero in the story. Yeah. I think Queen Vashti was. <laughs> Queen Vashti was maybe the first feminist in the Bible. You know, her, her king, uh, Ahasuerus or Xerxes, wanted to parade her before a bunch of men, and she refused, and she disobeyed his order. She's the real hero who disobeyed. And, and she's the whole reason why you even have the book of Esther. So, um, and by the way, Vashti was the first name of Vashti McCollum, who took the first real 1948 case about religion in the public schools. And so for us, Vashti McCollum is a true hero. Um, okay, I'll start with the five minute here. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think anyone imagines I was saying that all religious people are bad or that all religion is bad. There are many, I think most religious people are good people. I think in most cases, they're good people in spite of their religion. I think if you're a good person like Barry, you're gonna look for the good parts of the Bible. You're gonna look for the good in everything. There are religious people who are not good and what do they look for and what do they see? We all see that we sort of um, project ourselves into the scriptures. Uh, you are also right, Barry, that uh, not all of the Bible is horrible. There is some moral teaching in there but I roughly put it at about 10%. If you look at what the moral teachings of the Bible, about 90% of the moral teachings of the Bible are horrible. They are ugly, they are submissive, they are slave, uh, they are infanticidal and genocidal and pestilential and all those adjectives that Richard Dawkins used. I did a study for my last book about the word evil and wicked. I went through every time the words evil and wicked occurred in, in the Bible. They occurred about a thousand times. And more than 900 times, the words evil and wicked have nothing to do with what you or I would call morality of humans treating other human beings. The things that are considered wicked and evil in the scriptures, especially the Jewish scriptures, are um, idolatry, uh, intermarriage. Intermarriage was a horrible one. In fact, Phinehas was rewarded with a perpetual priesthood because he murdered a mixed race couple. The Jews were told not to mix with the Midianites, and yet one family did. He went in with a sword and killed both of them. And then his grandfather, Aaron, the high priest, said, you can be rewarded for doing this, for keeping our people, for keeping the race pure, basically. Uh, um, interracial marriage, not, not worshiping on the Sabbath, you can be put to death for that. So if you go through the Bible and look at the moral teachings, including what is considered bad or evil or wicked, about 90% of it is nothing that you and I would consider moral philosophy. There are some, obviously there are some good teachings. Love your neighbor, however, is said in the context of loving your Hebrew neighbor. They obviously didn't love their neighboring tribes. And when Jesus in the New Testament quoted that you should love your neighbor as yourself, he was quoting that verse that said, you will love your Hebrew kin as yourself. All groups do that. Every group loves their inner tribal group. Although you're right, there are some places where the stranger that is within you, if you have some slaves that are from if you have Hebrew slaves, you treat them differently than if you have external slaves. But um, um, th so you won't find, a, on balance, a positive moral philosophy within the Bible. But you do find it in things like secular humanism. Or look at, look at something like Stoicism, uh, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. There are people who follow and read that like a scripture. It's not religious. It's just a, a moral philosophy of life that gives you meaning, and there are people who gather with that. I wouldn't call Stoicism a religion. I think calling it a religion would, would cheapen it. So millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people on this planet live happy, good, moral, positive lives 
without religion. Religion is not for everybody. My wife is a third generation non-believer, and, and she, she and her brother turned out just great. They didn't go to church or synagogue. Uh, you know, they visited at weddings and that once in a while. And for them, it, it wasn't necessary. And if you think it's necessary to gather together to league religion with other people in order to bolster your morality, then it kind of shows a sort of a negative self-image of who you are as a human being, that you would need that external support. Yes, let's all support each other. In our conventions, we get together and we applaud, we give awards, we talk, we share, we, we share our experiences of awe and wonder and morality and trying to make this world a better place. But ultimately, each one of us has to make up of our own minds of what kind of person we want to be. Do we want to trust our own thought or do we want to submit to the authority of some system, which I would call religion, and I think on balance, that is not a good thing or at least not a useful thing for our planet. Okay. Um, first of all, I really appreciate Dan being here. He, he's someone that, like I said in the beginning, I have great admiration and respect for him and his organization. And I hope that everyone will look at his organization, what he's doing, and, and consider belonging and supporting what he's doing. I would like to suggest that. I think your initials are FFRF. I would say you might want to consider changing the name of your organization. Keep the initials, but call it Freedom from Religious Fundamentalism. Because your problem is with fundamentalism. It's not with a modern, uh, rational view of religion, of, of like the Unitarians who are out there championing the cause of women's rights and interfaith harmony, fighting for the environment. The, these things do serve a useful purpose. These things do gather people together, not because they're enfeebled or they can't do it on their own. It's just that it's fun to get together with other people and celebrate the, the, the universe and celebrate doing good and celebrate with music and food and, and celebrate bringing people together for a good cause. There's nothing wrong with that and everything right about it. And if you're doing it on your own, it's just hard to do it as effectively as if you were to do it with other people. That's just common sense. Um, I, I do want to say this. We didn't touch upon Afghanistan. But I will take Dan's position now. The reason why we fought for 20 years and spent over $2 trillion, over $300 million a day for 20 years and lost thousands of people and had thousands more maimed. The reason why all of that happened, all of it is partly because of what it says in my Bible. We read it in the book of Deuteronomy where it says that you should kill people who don't worship the right God, where it says that you should inquire of them. And if they don't say the right thing, wipe them out. And if they're worshiping the right God, but in the wrong way and saying things that are wrong, you should stone them to death or kill them. So I'm going to take Dan's side now and say that the reason why we fought for so long and nobody's even asking why, we fought for 20 years and lost thousands of people. Does anyone ever ask what motivates these people? What are they? We're fighting a battle of ideologies. We're fighting a battle in the marketplace of ideas and we don't even know we're fighting it. We think we can defeat them on the battlefield. Sometimes you have to fight on the battlefield but the same thing is happening in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and in Iran, across the Muslim world, you see people fighting and killing the non-believer. And I'll take the responsibility and say they got it from Judaism. And Judaism was a virus that taught that God said to kill in my name and Christianity and Islam are variants, more lethal variants. And because we brought this virus to the world, I take it as my responsibility as a Jew, especially on the day of atonement to atone and say, we're deeply sorry and we repudiate it. But we also have all these wonderful things in Judaism that can make this world a better place. So let's get together all the religions and get rid of what doesn't work and accept what does work. Judaism, I believe, rationally approached has the vaccine for hate, intolerance, and ignorance. It's called education, compassion, and love. And those things are extremely strong components of the Jewish people. We've devoted ourselves to compassion for the underdog, fighting for those who need a hand, contributing to the poor. These are things that are ingrained in the Jewish soul far more than these passages of the Torah that we've outgrown and outlived. Dan says, well, Judaism is very intolerant towards other people. Intermarriage is a horrible thing. 
I'm not sure if you know the story about Moses. He married Sipporah, who, who was a dark-skinned non-Jew daughter of a priest. And his siblings got all upset and criticized him. And his sister was struck with leprosy. Now you can say, well, God's chauvinistic. Why didn't he strike Aaron with something? Maybe he was just picking on the woman. Why leprosy? It was as if God was saying, you want white? I'll show you white. And so God, in this case, had a sense of humor. I don't believe in a personal God, but it's a fable that teaches us something important. By the way, when you asked about worship, I don't worship anything or anyone. 30 seconds, sense, Rabbi. I have a sense of reverence or awe. I deal with a CFI, and uh, I'm going to read you a quote from Einstein. The most beautiful and most profound experience is the sensation of the mystical. It is the sower of all true science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead, a snuffed out candle. To know that what is impenetrable to us really exists, manifesting itself as the highest wisdom and the most radiant beauty, which our dull faculties can comprehend only in their primitive forms. This knowledge, this feeling is at the center of true religiousness. Einstein was not secular. He was religious without a personal God. So those people in the chat who say, yeah, you're secular, you're secular. Not according to Einstein, not according to Sagan, not according to the greatest thinkers that we know. This is a rational and inspirational religion, which I call cosmic Judaism. I hope you'll all join us on, on Yom Kippur to atone because the best way that we can improve is to acknowledge our faults and do better. And that's what it means to be Jewish as well. Something that you don't necessarily see in other traditions, but you see in us. Dan, I hope this will not be the last time that we engage in debate and discussion. I uh, wanna work with you because I share your goals of weeding out irrational faith. And if I can do anything to support you, I'm your loyal foot soldier. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope to see you in future discussions.